Thank you everyone for joining Health for the World International Grand Rounds. We are honored to have our International Grand Rounds speaker today. Our uh, Grand Round speaker is Dr. Vidya Prakash. Uh, Dr. Prakash is a, is a professor in the Department of Internal Medicine and Vice Chair of Clinical Affairs at SIU School of Medicine. The talk for today is uh, syphilis, uh, which is an important infectious disease topic. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Prakash, for doing this for us. And uh, you can start whenever you're ready. Thank you so much, Dr. Rahani. And I am really honored to be here with all of you. Thank you so much. So I will be talking about syphilis. This is a brief uh, outline of what I will be discussing. Uh, I will start with the case and I will continue to go to that case throughout this presentation. We will touch on epidemiology, maternal to child transmission, molecular features and pathophysiology of syphilis. We will talk about the clinical features of all of the phases of syphilis, including primary, secondary, latent, and tertiary syphilis, diagnostics, treatment, and prevention. So without further ado, I'd like to start with the case. You have a 25-year-old female who presents to your clinic with a painless one by one centimeter ulcer on her vulva for the past week. She is sexually active, does not use condoms. Exam reveals a non-tender ulcer at the entrance of her vagina and mild bilateral non-tender inguinal lymphadenopathy. So the question is, what is your diagnosis? So essentially you have a 25-year-old female who is sexually active who has a painless chancre at the entrance of her vagina. So when you're looking through these answer choices, chancroid due to Haemophilus Ducree often presents or uniformly presents as a painful chancre. So she would have had a painful ulcer at the entrance of her vagina. So that's not the correct answer. HSV causes painful vesicular lesions, not a non-tender ulcer or a painless chancre. HPV usually presents as a wart. Um, so that brings us to primary and tertiary syphilis. And this is indeed a case of, of primary syphilis, a painless genital chancre. So when you look at sexually transmitted infections as a group, you can classify them according to genital ulcers, urethritis and cervicitis, pelvic inflammatory disease, diseases characterized by vaginal discharge, genital warts with HPV topping that list, HIV and hepatitis B. I put hepatitis C in parentheses because while it can be transmitted sexually, it's not considered a sexually transmitted disease. When you look further at genital ulcers, that can further be characterized by ulcers due to genital herpes, which are painful, ulcers due to syphilis, which I said are painless, chancroid due to Haemophilus ducree, which are painful, granuloma inguinale, which is due to the pathogen Klebsiella granulomatis, which causes chronic ulcerative genital lesions, and lymphogranuloma venarium, which is due to chl chlamydia trachomatis, serovars L1, L2, and L3, which can start as an ulcer, but then is hallmarked by painful inguinal lymphadenopathy. And I should say that genital herpes, syphilis, and chancroid by themselves are associated with an increased risk of acquiring HIV. So a little bit of historical background about syphilis. This is the famous Dutch philosopher Desiderius Erasmus, uh, who was known for his scholarly activity during the Northern Renaissance. He is quoted as having said, if I were asked which is the most destructive of all diseases, I should unhesitatingly reply, it is that which for some years has been raging with impunity. What contagion does thus invade the whole body, so much resist medical art, becomes inoculated so readily and so cruelly tortures the patient. And this was, the, to give you some historical context, in 1495, King Charles VIII of France suffered, and his soldiers suffered an outbreak of syphilis. And this was during the invasion of Naples in the first of the Italian wars. So again, so readily and inoculated so readily and so cruelly tortures the patient. So 
let's give you a little bit of background and introduction to syphilis. This is a systemic infection due to the spirochete trypanema pallidum, which you see on dark field microscopy here. Classically, it's acquired through sexual exposure as well as vertical transmission during pregnancy. It's an invasive infection. And what makes it interesting is that it is very good at evading the immune system, which we will talk about. And it's also known as the great mimicker because especially when you look at skin conditions that uh, are due to syphilis, they often mimic a myriad other uh, diseases. And we will talk more about that. If I had to sum up syphilis in one slide to talk about the natural history, it would be in this slide. So starting with initial infection, which I said is classically due to sexual transmission, you have growth of organisms at the site of inoculation. It's taken up by dendritic cells, goes to the regional lymph nodes, and then disseminates to various sites, including the central nerv nervous system. Within about three weeks, you have the painless chancre at the site of inoculation with regional lymphadenopathy, which is primary syphilis. Several weeks later, it progresses to secondary syphilis, which causes a disseminated rash, generalized lymphadenopathy, and often systemic symptoms. And then several weeks later, you get into the phase of latent syphilis which by definition is lack of clinical signs and symptoms of syphilis, but positive serologies. And interestingly, in this latent phase, up to 25% of individuals can have recurrence of the rash of secondary syphilis. In the latent phase, about 70% will suffer no further complications, but it's the 28% who can develop tertiary syphilis in the forms of gummitis, cardiovascular, and neurological syphilis. And we will talk about all of these in detail, but this slide, re slide really sums up the natural history of syphilis. A little bit about epidemiology. So annually, worldwide, we see 6 million cases, new cases of syphilis in persons between the ages of 15 to 49. Over 300,000 fetal and de neonatal deaths are due to syphilis and 215,000 infants are at increased risk of early death. In the late 1990s, our prevalence of syphilis declined. Why? Because there was a concerted effort to treat all sexually transmitted infections, including syphilis. People were making behavioral changes, and because of the AIDS epidemic, social networks were being disrupted. Why are we seeing a rise in recent years? Much of it has to do with the reconstruction of these social networks, and increased frequency of sexual contact. So when you look at the global distribution of syphilis, in 2012, the World Health Organization estimated that approximately 17.7 million individuals between the ages of 15 and 49 had syphilis. And you see the distribution depending on the geographic region. I will say in Africa, Africa bears the greatest burden of maternal syphilis, representing over 60% of the global estimate. When you look more closely at epidemiology, the distribution of syphilis differs between low and middle income countries and high income countries. In low and middle income countries, the reason that we have, part of the reason that we have such high, high rates is that there's poor rates of testing, particularly for women at the first antenatal visit. And further, with these higher rates of syphilis, a lower percentage are actually treated. And we also have higher endemic rates in these areas, which is characterized as non-venereal disease um, due to close skin-to-skin -skin contact due to higher populations. In high income countries, while we, the total population does not have as much of a burden of syphilis, we do have concentrations in specific populations, especially men who have sex with men, transgender women, and commercial sex workers. And all of these populations suffer very poor access to healthcare because of stigma and discrimination. So a little bit about maternal to child transmission. The risk of MTCT or mother to child transmission is highest when mom has primary or secondary syphilis. 
and her risk continues during her first four years after exposure. And after that, vertical transmission risk declines over time. And this is in an untreated mother. Sadly, around 30% of pregnancies result in fetal death in utero. Stillbirth, particularly late second and third trimestral, trimester fetal death, or death shortly after delivery. Infants with syphilis often are preterm. They have low birth weight. They have poor feeding. They're lethargic. They have rash, jaundice, hepatosplenomegaly, or anemia. So the bottom line is that screening and treatment during pregnancy is highly effective in reducing adverse birth outcomes. So in fact, in 2007, the World Health Organization launched a global initiative to eliminate syphilis. At the time that they launched the campaign, 1.4 million pregnant women had syphilis globally, and 80% of them had attended at least one antenatal visit, which really showed the World Health Organization missed opportunities for testing and treatment. So how did they accomplish decreasing the rates of maternal and congenital syphilis by 38 and 39% over five years? They started point of care testing to improve access to testing and treatment. And they used an integrative behavioral and medical intervention approach specifically into HIV prevention and control, which helped to control syphilis and other sexually transmitted infections. What the World Health Organization is working on now, their, their newest initiative to reduce STIs, involves comprehensive syphilis screening and treatment among pregnant women. And the goal is 90% reduction in syphilis incidence globally with 50 or fewer cases of congenital syphilis per 100,000 live births in 80% of countries by 2030. So we've talked a little bit about the introduction to syphilis, epidemiology, and MTCT. I would like to describe the molecular features of this pathogen. So I'd like to draw your attention to figure B here. Syphilis is a protoplasmic cylindrical organism that has an inner cytoplasmic membrane that's wrapped by a peptidoglycan sacculus and then surrounded by an outer membrane. Further, you have flagellar filaments that start with a flagellar motor on either end, wrap around the organism, and then they meet actually halfway uh, in the middle of the cell. And you'll notice this cross-section of syphilis you see the endoflagellar filaments in the periplasmic space between your cytoplasmic membrane and your outer membrane. I want to draw your attention to the dark field micrograph here in E, and then this top uh, portion here in A. And the reason I draw your attention to that is that syphilis is often described as spiral shaped or corkscrew shaped. It's actually a planar wave. It's not a spiral and it's not a corkscrew. And if you look at dark field micrograph E, the arrow and the arrowhead point to different parts of the pathogen at 90 degrees. And to the observer, it looks different at each of those angles, which is characteristic of a wave. A corkscrew, um, a corkscrew or a spiral would actually look the same regardless of the angle. So remember, it's actually more of a planar wave. So this is a freeze fracture electron micrograph of Trypanema pallidum. And I want to draw your attention to the red circles. These are outer membrane proteins that span the entire surface of the organism. So what about these proteins? So remember, when you look at the outer membrane as a whole, it's protein poor. About 1%, con it, is, it consists of about 1% of these membrane-spanning pro proteins, and they're known as trypanema pallidum repeat proteins, or TPR proteins. They're potential vaccine targets, and they're also potential targets for complement killing by antibodies, but because they're so poorly concentrated and spread so far apart on the membrane, it's very, very difficult to target for vaccines, and it's also very difficult for the immune system. And so this is part of what I talked about as far as syphilis being immunoevasive, where it evades the immune system. 
So how, what is the pathophysiology of syphilis? You've seen the outer membrane and the inner workings of the pathogen. How does it invade the, the human? So what happens is that at the time of inoculation, the organism is taken up by dendritic cells and taken to local lymph nodes. And it's in the local lymph nodes that the pathogen is presented to T cells and B cells. So the T cells secrete interferon gamma, which results in macrophage stimulation, where macrophages and multiple inflammatory cells, as you see in B, this is from a skin biopsy of a syphilitic lesion, you have a very robust inflammatory response with your spirochetes and your interferons um, and, and your immune system really attacking the pathogen. And the primary mode of clearance is through macrophages. The other part of this, in addition to the T cell response, is production of opsonic antibodies and phagocytosis, which you see here in this uh, picture here in C. I would also like to draw your attention to A, um, this electron micrograph, where the arrowheads show junctions between infected endothelial cells. And so remember, you can have marked proliferation and endothelial swelling that can actually lead to occlusion of arteries uh, and frank endarteritis obliterans. So we've talked a little bit about epidemiology. We've talked a little bit about maternal to child, mom, mother to child transmission, as well as the structure of the pathogen and pathophysiology. Let's talk about what you will see in the clinical setting. So I told you that we start with primary syphilis. So this is, as we described in the case that I showed you, a painless genital chancre. So you see one on the penis here, and this is a vulvar chancre in a woman. This incubates between three to 90 days, although it's typically 21 days after initial infection. It lasts on average three to eight weeks and it resolves spontaneously without treatment. Diagnosis of primary syphilis, clinical diagnosis. A sexually active patient with a classic painless chancre is syphilis, primary syphilis, until proven otherwise. What can help you with diagnostics is dark field microscopy of fluid from the lesion. Be careful with ordering blood tests at this stage. Only 50% of people with primary syphilis will have a positive serology, which we will talk about in a little bit. It usually takes at least two to three weeks from initial symptoms to have a positive serology. So really for primary syphilis, it's a history clinical diagnosis, and supported by dark field microscopy of fluid from the lesion. Secondary syphilis. So the patient was inoculated within three weeks, had that painless chancre, and about three weeks later, or six weeks after the initial contact, they will have signs of secondary syphilis. So classically, secondary syphilis presents with a skin rash. You can have an urticarial to maculopapular to pustular rash on the trunk. You can also have classic coin-shaped lesions on the palms and soles, and even mucocutaneous lesions in the mouth. You can also have systemic symptoms like fever, lymphadenopathy, myalgias, and fatigue. And as I said, it occurs on average six weeks after initial contact. So if you look at the time, within three weeks of contact primary syphilis, six weeks from initial contact, secondary syphilis. And in this phase, you will have positive serologies. And we will talk a little bit further specifically about serologies, but here your serologies will be positive. So this is an example of a very nonspecific maculopapular rash in a patient with secondary syphilis. This top left corner is a papulosquamous rash associated with secondary syphilis always do a good oral exam in patients that you suspect have syphilis because you can see these mucocutaneous lesions in the oropharynx. Alopecia, unexplained alopecia may be a sign of secondary syphilis. So consider that in a sexually active patient who is starting to lose their hair. These are the classic coin-shaped lesions that I was talking about 
you always want to look on the palms and you have to take their socks and shoes off and look at their soles because you can see these lesions on the palms and soles. And I should tell you, these lesions are teeming with spirochetes. Latent syphilis, okay? So you've had primary syphilis with the painless chancre. Several weeks later, you have secondary syphilis with the rash um, and the systemic symptoms. Eventually, without treatment, there's progression to latent syphilis, which by definition is no clinical signs or symptoms, but positive serologies. And patients can stay in this latent phase for years without classic signs or symptoms. So then what happens? Like I said, up to 30% will progress to late or tertiary syphilis. That can appear as early as one year to as late as 30 years after the initial infection. On average, it can present three to seven years after initial infection. And remember, in your HIV patients, it's a much more rapid progression from latent to uh, later tertiary syphilis. So this, I'm going to start with gummatous syphilis, which are the skin lesions associated with tertiary syphilis. In this uh, picture here, in this photo, you see serpiginous gummatous lesions of the forearm. And here you see ulcerative gummatous lesions. And this is why syphilis is considered the great mimicker. The reason is that there's a huge differential diagnosis for these types of lesions. And the, especially gummatous syphilis can present in so many different ways. You can see annular scaling plaques that may make you think of psoriasis. You can see discoid lesions that may make you think of discoid lupus. Um, these ulcerative lesions, depending on where you are, can look like uh, cutaneous leishmaniasis, leprosy, and deep fungal infections. So this is why syphilis is considered the great mimicker. Tertiary syphilis, we talked about gummatous syphilis. Tertiary syphilis can also affect the aorta. Syphilis aortitis can cause separation and contraction of your aortic valve leaflets, which leads to aortic insufficiency and heart failure. Further, aortic wall inflammation can lead to thickened endothelium through a phenomenon that's known as tree barking. And the base of the aorta, involvement of syphilis at the base of the aorta can cause narrowing of the ostea of the coronary arteries, which you see in this picture here, the arrowheads are pointing to the narrowed ostea. That leads to accumulation of atherosclerotic plaques and coronary artery disease and myocardial infarction. Due to immune complex deposition, you can also have obliterative endocarditis, which I referred to in my slide talking about the pathophysiology of syphilis. So we talked about gummatous and uh, aortic syphilis. Remember tertiary syphilis can also affect the brain. So you can have meningovascular inflammation, cerebral vessel inflammation leading to stroke-like symptoms, general paresis, and a phenomenon known as tabes dorsalis. So tabes dorsalis is really a loss of sensation due to demyelination of the dorsal roots of the posterior spinal column. And as a result, patients can have ataxia. Tabes dorsalis due to sensory denervation also causes damaging to your weight-bearing joints, specifically your knees. And tabes is classically described as lancinating pain in the back, radiating to the lower extremities. You can also have neurologic syphilis manifesting as the argyl robertson pupil, where the pupil is small, it doesn't react to light or painful stimuli, but it does accommodate normally. So it does not respond to light or pain, but accommodates. Neurosyphilis can occur at any stage of syphilis. So whether it's primary or secondary or tertiary, you can have involvement of the brain. In the early stages, you can have meningitis. You can also have cranial nerve neuropathy specifically cranial nerve seven, which can cause facial paralysis, and cranial nerve eight, that can cause sensory neural hearing loss, as well as uh, vestibulitis. You can also have ocular disease, which manifests as uveitis. And late neurosyphilis, we already talked about a lot of this, where they can present with general paresis, 
ataxia and tabes dorsalis, and add to that list dementia and personality changes can be signs of late neurosyphilis. I would be remiss if I did not mention the infamous Tuskegee study that occurred in the United States. In Macon County, Alabama, between 1932 and 1972, the U.S. Public Health Service collaborated with the Tuskegee Institute and recruited 431 African-American men. And they were told they would be given free medical care for bad blood, and they were never told they had syphilis. And they were followed to establish natural, natural progression of the disease. The problem is that not only were they not told that they had syphilis, but the efficacy of penicillin was established by the late 1940s. And these men were not told that that treatment was available uh, and standard of care. And this resulted in several deaths among these men, as well as wives getting infection and many cases of congenital syphilis. As a result of this study, we established the Mel Belmont Report which outlines the ethical principles and guidelines for the protection of human subjects and research. So I'm gonna go back to my case. So you have your 25 year old female in your clinic, sexually active woman with a painless genital chancre, and you know that this is primary syphilis clinically. So how will you diagnose this patient? A lot of this you should know by now based on the discussion that I had. Remember your serologies like your RPR and your FTA antibody are not going to be positive this early. So really, the diagnosis rests on the clinical exam. If I had had dark field microscopy as a possibility here, that would have been the correct answer as well. But among the answer choices, your clinical exam is the way you diagnose this patient. So let's talk about diagnosis. I talked so much about dark field microscopy. Remember, this provides definitive diagnosis and you can have an answer the same day. And you see the spirochetes here in dark field microscopy. I talked about serology. So what are the serologies? You have treponemal tests, which are very specific, and you have non-treponemal tests, which are very sensitive. Your non-treponemal tests are your RPR, or rapid plasma reagent, and your VDRL, or your venereal disease research laboratory test. Your treponemal tests, you have three of them, three primary ones. The one that we most commonly use in clinical practice in the United States are your fluorescent treponemal antibody absorption test, or FTA antibody, and others are your TPPA and your TPEIA, which is an en enzyme immunoassay. Beware, you don't want to just check one or the other. You want to check one of each. So one non-treponemal test and one treponemal test. With an RPR alone, you can see false negatives in primary syphilis, which is why I said don't even check it in primary syphilis. Don't expect it to be positive. You can see false positive results occasionally, especially in patients with HIV uh, and autoimmune diseases. And the benefit of both RPR and VDRL is that you can check the titer to correlate with how they are doing clinically. The titer will eventually go down with treatment over many months. Although with an RPR, beware, some patients, even with successful treatment, can have a persistently positive titer, also known as being serofast. The VDRL is another non-treponemal test. Like an RPR, it will go down with treatment. And it is the only available test for the cerebral spinal fluid to check for neurosyphilis. It's very specific, but not very sensitive in the cerebral spinal fluid. So remember, I said the non-treponemal tests as a whole in the blood are very sensitive and not specific, but the VDRL in the cerebral spinal fluid is very specific. So remember that distinction. This gives you a graph of what happens to the serologies over time. So at the bottom, you have time of infection. So the first part is in weeks, the latter part is in years, and it correlates with primary, secondary, latent, and tertiary syphilis. So remember, from the time of infection, it takes two to three weeks before you can expect your serologies to be positive, namely your RPR and VDRL and your FTA antibody. 
It's over weeks to months that you see a peak in both of them and notice even with treatment, even with treatment, your specific FTA antibodies will stay nice and high and will stay positive typically for a lifetime, although even 20% of patients may lose it. But a majority of patients will stay positive over a lifetime, whether they are treated or not. After six months, the VDRL and RPR over time will start going down with treatment. If they're untreated, it remains positive, which is when you make the diagnosis of latent and tertiary syphilis. As I said before, with treatment, the RPR should go down to zero, but there are patients who can remain zero fast, and we're not actually sure why. A little bit about a testing algorithm. The one that's most commonly used is the traditional one. So primary syphilis, remember, you don't check the serologies, you do dark field microscopy and you diagnose it clinically. For the later stages of syphilis, so secondary, latent, and tertiary syphilis, you start with a qualitative non-trypanemal test, so an RPR or a VDRL. If that's positive, you confirm with the trypanemal test. And if both those are positive, you treat. And certainly if one or both are negative, you don't treat. Here's the problem with the traditional testing is because of the prozone phenomenon. So when you have overwhelming infection due to syphilis, what happens is that you have an overwhelming antibody response and the test, which really looks at antigen antibody complexes to be positive, cannot form the antibody antigen complexes because the antibodies are overwhelming the antigen so you can get a false negative. If you look at the reverse algorithm, which actually starts with the trypanemal test, that actually, uh, you don't have the prozone phenomenon because the trypanemal test is immune to that. So if you have a trypanemal test that's positive, remember, even patients who were treated will have a positive test. So then you have to wonder, is it positive because of previous infection or current infection? So if they've previously not been treated, then you know it's a current active infection, in which case you treat. If the trypanemal test is positive and they have been treated, you have to wonder, is it a past infection or current infection, which can be resolved with a non-trypanemal test with an RPR or VDRL? If that's positive, then you need to treat. If that's negative, then you don't need to treat, or if your suspicion is high enough, then you use a different trypanemal test. This reverse serology process is more labor intensive, but you stand to catch more patients with syphilis this way than with the traditional test. And, and you don't have the danger of the prozone effect. I'm going to run through the different modalities um, of syphilis uh, testing. So dark field microscopy I've already talked about. It starts, you check the fluid from the chancre, erosive cutaneous lesions of primary, secondary, or congenital syphilis. And as I said before, you can make the diagnosis the same day. The disadvantage is that if it's negative, don't believe um, that it's, it's necessarily negative if you have a, a patient with the classic signs and symptoms up to 30% can have false negatives. You also can't use it for oral or rectal specimens. It requires specialized equipment. It's labor intensive. You need an expert in order to be able to find this. And it's subjective. DFA or direct fluorescent antibody staining uses the same lesions as dark field microscopy. Unlike dark field microscopy, you can use it for oral lesions. It's very specific to trypanema pallidum. And unlike dark field microscopy, you can actually save the sample and ship it. Like dark field microscopy though, it's insensitive. It also requires specialized equipment. We don't really have the stains available and it requires a lot of expertise and it is subjective. When you look at immunohistochemistry and PCR, so immunohistochemistry can be used for skin lesions, mucosal lesions, and tissue lesions are fixed are on fixed paraffin embedded tissues using antibody reagents for trypanema. 
You can save the sample or ship it. You can use tissue as samples from placenta or the umbilical cord. And it's especially useful for tissue biopsies when syphilis was not initially suspected. It's insensitive. Again, it requires specialized equipment and stains. It's labor intensive. And again, this is subjective. PCR, the advantage is that it can be used in oral and rectal lesions and it can be stored or frozen. It's sensitive and specific for genital ulcer specimens, but we don't really have an internationally approved or commercially available test. And further, it's insensitive and again, requires specialized ex expertise and equipment. We talked a lot about your non trupanemal tests, your VDRL and your RPR. <clears throat> so VDRL, remember, this is the only test that we can use to diagnose neurosyphilis <clears throat> in the CSF. And you can also use it on serum and plasma, <clears throat> like your RPR. Both of these can be used to monitor treatment and efficacy. They're both inexpensive. And RPR is actually more simple to do than VDRL. Results are available the same day within 15 minutes. And they're up to 100% sensitive and 98% specific. VDRL and RPR can cause false positives due to chronic or acute conditions. They both have to be performed manually. It requires microscopy for VDRL. Um, VDRL antigen suspension, you have to prepare it daily. You can't use it on whole blood. It requires a centrifuge, similar to RPR. And both of these are subjective. You need uh, a skilled laboratory clinician in order to be able to diagnose this and run the tests. Finally, your specific test, your trypanemal test, your FTA antibody test, can be run on serum or plasma. It is the gold standard in many low and middle income countries, up to 100%, 99% specific. It's not recommended for resolution of discordant results. It's time consuming, it's expensive, it's difficult to read, requires specialized reagents and a microscope, manual operation, and you can see occasional false positives in pregnant patients or patients with autoimmune disease. So back to our case. You have a 25-year-old female who presents to your clinic with that ulcer, sexually active. She has a painless genital chancre, and she has primary syphilis. You have made that clinical diagnosis. You have likely looked at it under the dark field microscopy. How are you going to treat primary syphilis? The correct answer here is benzathine penicillin, 2.4 million units intramuscularly. So we talked about clinical presentation. How do we treat these patients? The recommended regimen for adults with primary and secondary syphilis is one shot of benzathine penicillin, 2.4 million units IM in a single dose. You have to check these patients clinically and serologically at six and 12 months after treatment. If they have persistent signs or symptoms, or a fourfold rise in titers, or if they don't achieve a fourfold drop in titers, you have to worry about treatment failure or reinfection, in which case you have to retreat with three injections of benzathine penicillin G and consider CSF analysis to make sure you're not missing neurosyphilis and screen for HIV. Latent syphilis, you also wanna treat with one shot of benzathine penicillin in one dose. So with latent syphilis, remember, there is early latent syphilis, there's late latent syphilis, and there's latent syphilis of unknown duration. Early latent syphilis by CDC guidelines is syphilis acquired within the last year. So you know that their last negative serology was within the last year, or you know their exposure was within the last year. The World Health Organization uses two years, CDC uses one year. Late latent syphilis is more than one year per CDC, more than two years per World Health Organization. Um, and unknown duration is exactly what it sounds like. We don't know the duration. And with that, with late latent syphilis or latent syphilis of unknown duration, you administer three doses of benzathine penicillin at one week intervals. So follow-up testing for, for this type of syphilis you do non trypanemal tests at 6, 12, and 24 months. And again, you're going to do a spinal tap and check CSF if they have a four-fold or greater increase seen for at least two weeks. 
or if the titer does not decline at least fourfold within 12 to 24 months, or signs or symptoms of syphilis develop. If they, you check the CSF and it's negative, you retreat for latent syphilis and you screen for HIV. If they're penicillin allergic for primary and secondary syphilis, you treat with doxycycline for 14 days, tetracycline for 14 days, ceftriaxone for 10 to 14 days, and you can use azithromycin, although there have been treatment failures documented, in which case you only use if their penicillin cannot be used, doxy is not available, and you don't wanna use it in men who have sex with men, patients with HIV or pregnancy. Gummitis and cardiovascular syphilis, again, you want to check that they don't have neurosyphilis with a CSF exam, and you treat with three doses of benzathine penicillin G. Neurosyphilis and ocular syphilis, you treat a little bit more aggressively with aqueous penicillin G with 18 to 24 million units a day over 10 to 14 days. And if you worry about compliance, then they need to come in and get procaine penicillin 2.4 million units IM once daily, along with oral probenicid for 10 to 14 days. If they have CSF pleocytosis initially, you repeat the CSF every six months until the cell count is normal. And you retreat if the cell count has not normalized or if the protein is abnormal after two years. Sex, sex partners, if they've had contact within 90 days, you treat for early syphilis, even if the serology is negative. And if the serology is not available, you treat anyway. But if it is available, um, if it's negative, you don't treat if it's been over 90 days. People who are higher risk sex partners are if they've had contact within three months for patients who have primary syphilis, six months for secondary syphilis, and one year with early latent syphilis. What about pregnant patients? If they're pregnant and penicillin allergic, we don't really have good alternatives. You can't use tetracycline or doxy during pregnancy. There's insufficient data for ceftriaxone or azithro. Erythromycin will not cure the fetus. And so ultimately, a pregnant woman will need to be desensitized and treated with penicillin. HIV and syphilis, it's basically the same treatment regimens, but you have to keep a closer eye on them. So primary and secondary syphilis, clinical and serologic monitoring at 3, 6, 9, 12, and 24 months. Latent syphilis, 6, 12, 18, and 24 months. And remember, HIV patients, no matter what stage of syphilis they are in, very low threshold for LP, especially if they have a lower CD4 count and their RPR is greater than one in 32. And a diagnosis of neurosyphilis is when you have over 20 white blood cells in the CSF. Finally, prevention. Abstinence is key, but if you can't have abstinence, you encourage your patients to use latex condoms consistently and correctly, as you can, although you can still acquire syphilis from an ulcer not covered by a condom, so they still need to exercise caution. Encourage them to stay in monogamous relationships with someone who has been tested and not, does not have infection. Partner notification if the patient tests positive, and screening and treatment of pregnant mothers. And these are my references. Thank you so much for listening. I will take questions now. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So my question is about syphilitic amyotrophy. So I recently had a 36-year-old female who had one week history of muscle weakness in her left upper limb, and there was okay. wasting, there was wasting of the spina hypotenar eminence and the uh, super uh, spinatus muscle. Okay. So her reflexes were diminished on that hand and she had fasciculations on her tongue. So while okay. I was doing a workup for just neurologic diseases, the DVRL came back positive and the TPSA was positive. But okay. the TSF was normal. So I was okay. asking for stability and neurotrophy, do you treat it as Neurosyphilis, or you treat it as latent syphilis. 
so was your question, do you treat as neurosyphilis or do you? Yeah. Yes. So it's, if it were me and I had a choice for this patient between treating between neurosyphilis and tertiary syphilis, I would probably treat for neurosyphilis with the procaine penicillin for 10 to 14 days. I think that would be the most risk averse way of treating the patient. Any other questions? Any other questions, guys? <laughs> okay. And if you have any other questions, you can also send it to us later, and then I will send it to Dr. Prakash by email, if that works better. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Prakash. This was excellent. Thank you. And very, inform very informative and helpful. So thank you so much. We really appreciate you doing this for us. Thank you, and thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Have a, have a great day. You too. Bye-bye. Uh, Dr. Prakash? Yeah. I think there is one question about treatment of ocular syphilis uh, in the Q&A box. Uh, yes. So ocular syphilis would fall under, and I think I had it in here. I'm sorry. No way. Yeah, so this would fall under the categorization of neurosyphilis, um, uveitis. So you would treat it the same as neurosyphilis with benzathine penicillin G for 10 to 14 days. Or I'm sorry, procaine penicillin for 10 to 14 days, as we discussed for neurosyphilis. Okay. Um, and very close to ophthalmologic and infectious diseases follow up. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you doing this for us and have a lovely yeah. Thanks. And, uh, Thank you so much. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. You too. Bye-bye. Uh, thanks, Albert. And thanks, internal medicine residents uh, in uh, Bengal, Cameroon. Stay safe, and I'll see you next week. Take care.